Well, good morning, everybody. Um, good to uh, sort of sort of see you. Um, <clears throat> we've got um, a number of slides which I'm now going to see if I can share successfully. Um, bear with me. Hopefully you can you can now all see the um, the title the title slide. So I'm going to go first um, for for a few minutes. Then Nicola's going to uh, come in and particularly talk about um, homelessness uh, and the, and the coordination work that she's been doing um, <clears throat> in, in uh, across Northern Ireland with um, homelessness providers. Um, and then then uh, we, we, we'll pause for. Um, some Q and A, and and then we, we we've got a couple of further sessions. I don't know whether you can make make it out, but um, I, I may I may have been trying to trying too hard. But the idea of the image on the front page is to show COVID nineteen casting a shadow over uh, over social housing. Um, this is broadly speaking what we're going to what we're going to talk about. I'm not going to go through the list. You you can see it there. Um, in the top right, you'll see uh, Sir Patrick Valance, who has been um, a regular, uh, a, a regular uh, vision, for want of a better word, on our uh, on our TV screens, along with Chris Whitty. Um, and um, the uh, front page of last week's Inside Housing, uh, particularly interesting and perhaps alarming, although probably little surprise for those of us working in social housing. Um, highlighting the the um, significant correlation between um, overcrowding in um, in social housing and the COVID-19 death rate. So some initial thoughts on uh, where we are where we are now. Um, it may be only four or five months ago, but housing obviously looked very different. Um, I'm not sure it was the sort of picture of bucolic delight you've got in the top right hand corner. Um, and, and indeed, I've, I've always said that um, housing has um, probably attracted more changes in legislation, guidance, policy and practice than just about any other area of, of public policy over the last 25 years, but frankly, it's been nothing compared to this. Nonetheless, we, as, as you'll recall, um, we had some pretty serious challenges that we were endeavouring to deal with around demand and, and development, uh, the effect of Brexit in relation to labour and materials, regulation and risk, compliance, particularly around fire risk, climate change, um, digitisation, value for money, and so forth. But then, of course, the, the pandemic hit us. Um, I'm not obviously going to go into um, detail on this. You all know the, the reality that we're all dealing with on a day-by-day -day basis. But um, it is worth highlighting or, or reminding, uh, reminding us all of the, the government's five tests, um, particularly before lockdown could be relaxed, or this is what they were saying in March, um, and arguably numbers one, two, and three have been dealt with. Uh, number four, well, I was reading yesterday that the test and trace um, system is not reckoned, is not expected to be fully in operation until September. Um, as for whether exiting lockdown will trigger a second peak, well, frankly, who knows with the, um, the R rate not far short of not far short of one, and the uh, the table on the right shows shows the UK with a higher proportion of uh, confirmed COVID nineteen cases than I think any other country in, in the world. Um, and down the bottom, the um, excess deaths. Um, and um, the general view is that while we appear to be heading officially for forty thousand deaths from COVID nineteen or associated with COVID nineteen. Um, across the UK, the true number is likely to be closer to 60,000, tragically. Um, and um, some, significant, some significant changes um, have, have taken place. I mean, the, the amount of money that the government has um, thrown at the situation to uh, try and shore up the economy is um, fairly, fairly astonishing. Um, and and the, the, up, up the top there, you've got a number of projections from the um, from the Bank of England and um, other other government bodies. 
Staff furloughing, um, I, I believe that anything up to a third of the UK workforce has been furloughed at least part of the time. Um, and, and the major concern is, of course, that as the furlough um, uh, availability and, and, and the costing of it um, is, um, is, is reduced, then we're going to see more and more redundancies. Um, as, far as, as far as housing development is concerned, obviously a very significant uh, proportion of developments were, were put on hold um, between, reckoned to be between 40 and 50 percent, and the great majority of those schemes now fortunately are restarting, albeit gradually and under a different physical distancing regime. Um, a number of you will have, will have heard about the the um, WhatsApp group that Campbell to Kel set up. We, we, we set this up um, <clears throat> in uh, the middle of March. It was about a week before lockdown and it was particularly for chief executives of housing, um, housing organizations uh, and um, it rapidly grew to around two, well in fact over 220 CEOs um, as uh, members, uh, members and, and participants of the group from right across the, the UK and also um, in, in uh, the Republic of Ireland uh, as well. And we have a huge mix of organisations represented there. Um, many of the largest housing associations in the UK th through to um, quite a few of the smallest organisations. We've got homelessness agencies, specialist care and support uh, supported housing providers and so on. And it's been um, a very active source of debate and discussion. And the reason we set it up in the first place is because we've always been conscious that uh, in a chief executive role, you can be quite alone. There aren't necessarily um, other, other people that you can readily share with, um, uh, whether one's talking about other, exec other members of executive teams or, or the board. The relationships are a little bit different. But creating, if you like, a sort of safe space for chief executives to get together and um, unload and share um, issues and, and, and concerns and potential solutions to um, immediate problems, given that everybody was facing the same set of problems, we felt would be valuable. And, and so, it's, so it's turned out in, in reality with well, it's, it's calmed down a little bit in, in, in the last few weeks as, as we've got to a sort of a, a slightly different kind of normal from what we were dealing with um, right, right at the, in, in the early stages in um, late March and, and early April. Um, and, you know, on, on, on individual days, we were getting any, anything up to 150 messages posted on the group. Um, the, the sort of issues that sector leaders then have been focusing on um, repairs, but and this is not necessarily in any order of, of priority. Um, repairs, though, have been um, a major consideration. Many organisations do it dealing with emergency repairs only, others doing emergency and compliance or emergency compliance and voids. Um, Contractor availability. Uh, there, there, there were concerns expressed that some of some lift contractors, in particular, weren't weren't going to be uh, prepared or, or able to come out to deal with um, deal with those kind of problems, and that would be a, a major problem in terms of um, you know particularly where where one had vulnerable residents. Key workers. Who is a key worker? Still not clearly defined. Access to PPE. Death rate in care homes. Um, arrangements for providing accommodation for street homeless people, rent arrears increasing, um, the, the, the general picture appears to be around about a 10% increase uh, across the country, um, and organisations seeking to maximise their cash holdings, particularly given the uncertainty of the, um, the way that um, the, uh, the, the pandemic and, and dealing with it is going to unfold over over coming, over coming months. So, for example, um, there, there were a number of uh, number of housing housing associations that have put developments, new development schemes to which they weren't already committed, um, on, on ice. Um, in some cases, even where they'd been working on those development schemes for a period of years. Um, other immediate concerns. Mental health has been um, a major concern and consideration, as you would expect, and that, that's both as regards residents, particularly vulnerable residents, but also staff. 
being expected to deal with um, extreme and um, unplanned sets of circumstances and doing so in many cases remotely working from home in a way that they weren't normally used to. Tenant hardship has been uh, a particular area of concern. A number of housing associations have set up or, or have been making donations to their own tenant hardship funds. Um, domestic violence, uh, child abuse, antisocial behaviour, tragically but, but probably unsurprisingly spiking in this time. Um, challenges around a rem remote working, um, plainly if you if you take a workforce that's used to being based in an office and send them all to work from home um, some are going to have space in order to do that um, others particularly and commonly younger people um, uh, in more junior roles may well have, may well be struggling um, with uh, with dodgy broadband or with working from their bedrooms or on kitchen tables in shared flats and so on um, a lot of discussion about furloughing staff on the group. Is it the right thing to do? Under what circumstances? And so on. Um, and um, governance. Obviously, governance sort of changed overnight with m moving to um, to uh, online board meetings. But um, in some cases, particularly in the early stages, when very rapid decisions needed to be made, um, or, or organisations looking for um, changes to their delegated authority arrangements. So these are the kind of issues that that, that, that were um, that have been talked about most on the on the WhatsApp group, particularly over the over the first few weeks. And what I and, and what I've described it on the slide as a sort of sticking plaster phase, trying to deal with the most urgent and, and immediate issues. Gradually and increasingly, though, the CEOs um, on the group have been moving to longer term thinking on the basis that we aren't going to be going, whatever happens and however long it takes us to get through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we aren't going to be going back to the way that uh, business was done in the past. There are bound to be um, a, a number of changes and many of those will be quite significant changes. So I'm now going to pause and hand over to, to Nicola who's going to talk particularly about, about homelessness and the work that she's been coordinating um, with the homelessness sector um, in Northern Ireland. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, this first slide is really to, to demonstrate the importance of communications around a crisis situation. And I started working with the sector at the start of April. And at that stage, they'd already set up a multi-agency group. Um, and this was very much sector led, it was chaired by Jim Dennison. Um, and had all the, the voluntary and statutory providers. So it's very interesting to note that, um, that the, engagement, um, the engagement structures within homelessness um, are quite, they're quite set and, uh, and they've been well thought through. But when it came to actually managing um, this crisis situation, they felt the need to bring together this multi-agency group that, that meets weekly, looks at issues around um, funding, um, access to PPE, um, testing, which is becoming um, an increasingly important issue for the sector in terms of new referrals. Um, looking at bed spaces, bringing on new bed spaces and probation as well. As you remember, there's about, I think it was around 154 prisoners were released one day. And also looking at exit planning, so that group still, still meets weekly. Um, and then the sector itself decided it was, it was important to, to have a voice um, and to have someone to actually coordinate the liaison work between the sector and the statutory providers. And that's whenever they commissioned Campbell's Kell to take on board that role. Um, and that's something I do part time. And, and it is really about um, communication, coordinating it uh, between the both feeding in and feeding out and um, assisting in any interve and interventions, any problems, any blockages along the line and inputting into guidance for the sector and also input into exit planning. And what we've done is we've set up a homeless uh, operations group um, and it's really helping the housing executive um, to develop its exit plan. Uh, there's six organisations on that group. Um, we've met twice so far. It's really about documenting the learning, um, documenting how new challenges, uh, taking a what works approach so what's what's working and what we want to continue um, to do going forward um, and what improvements can be made in the short to medium term and then keeping a, a longer term kind of eye and view on the, the challenges which are coming down the line for the sector. Um, so Zena, do you want to skip on to the next one? Oh, sorry, have you got Greg? Can you do that? 
for me, or I can do it. Um, so just to run through briefly on some of the issues. So if you remember, um, there was great publicity around everyone in approach. Uh, and the housing executive um, was able to move, along with the Welcome Centre and a number of other providers, able to move 50 uh, rough sleepers off the streets. Most of those people went into non-standard accommodation, so the housing executive had to secure additional um, single lets, uh, also additional beds in, in the Dream Pods and in the hotels and in, and in BME. So um, that was a huge challenge to, to undertake, to get everybody in, and it was very, very successful. But a lot of those people are no recourse to public funds, and the big question is what happens next. Um, particularly whenever there's bad capacity issues within the sector um, and, and certainly nobody wants to be put back on the streets again. We're already seeing some people moving back on the streets. Um, that's not something that we want to see going forward. We want to make sure that everybody um, has temporary accommodation, has the support that they need. A number of services had to reconfigure in terms of in-reach and outreach. So if we take Welcome, for example, it has a drop-in centre. It had to close that. A drop-in facility closed and had to very quickly switch to an outreach model and it provided um, support to and meals, hot meals for example, for people um, living in accommodation where there wasn't any cooking facilities um, and people on income say we're going to provide food packs and that so there's some refiguration of services happening. Some of that's working very well and we need to decide what happens in terms of moving forward. Do we continue some of that work? We just bad capacity because of um, self-isolation, social distancing, uh, shared facilities. So bed capacity within the sector has been reduced quite significantly, particularly um, in older style hostels um, and the likes of Centenary House, for example. Um, and it's just not really designed um, to, to allow for, for social distancing with a lot of shared facilities. And um, so reduced bed capacity overall has been a huge challenge and accepting your referrals into hostels is becoming an issue. Um, there's been no incidents in the hostels, but there's been no one tested positive in the hostels. We've been very fortunate around that. And now um, hostel providers are really concerned about accepting new referrals and possibly bringing COVID in. So they're looking at um, raising issues around testing for new referrals. Obviously, the centre of all this is clients and client behaviour and supporting their needs. Overall, compliance has been really good. Um, and people have been uh, adhering to um, the advice, but obviously uh, there's been a more lax attitude recently and people are going out more, they're, they're circulating more, they're, they're, they're going back on the streets again, um, meeting up in groups. Um, and again, it's how, how you actually control that in a residential setting. Um, making sure that the client's needs are matched to the accommodation is a big thing. So there's client who, clients who have um, significant complex needs are being placed into hotel, non-standard accommodation, and they're not having the support that they need. So getting that right is really important going forward. Staff and pressures, I'm sure like yourselves, you've, you've faced those. It, it was a challenge in a number of the hostels. And as a result of that, um, the housing executive invested in a crisis cover. Um, service which operates throughout Ireland to provide um, basically immediate access to people who can who can basically backfill um, whenever um, staff are self-isolating um, and that we, we've pulled we put, put the pause button on that but I've said just be cautious in case there is a second surge um, and we do need to to get staff into, into the hostels quite quickly so we're, we're keeping a watch and eye on that. There wasn't an increase in demand in TA, but there is now, funny enough. Um, not really funny enough, because it's not funny, obviously, but um, there's an increased demand in TA from single people whose um, relationships are breaking down. Um, addiction issues are coming to the fore. Um, and this is going to present a problem moving forward. So if I, get, I give you a stat here, in, in April in 2019, there was 156 placements in TA. In April this year, there was 413. You know, so there's a huge, huge demand for temporary accommodation and we can't see that changing going forward. As well as the, the new single homeless people who are, who are coming onto the streets um, who are seeking accommodation as a result of a breakdown in sharing arrangements. Um, there, there's also this question about will there be more increased family homelessness as a result of um, job losses you know, going forward. So will that impact, impact then on people's ability to pay the mortgage and rent and what can we do around that? Second surge, I'll not go into that. There's talk about a second surge in the winter. So we're, we're, not, we're not out of the woods yet with this. And I guess overall, the, strongly what's coming out of this is the need for collaborative working. It's been really positive. The, the, 
the partnerships that have developed between between accommodation providers themselves and also the statutory services and in particular PHA um, and health and social care has been really important and we want to continue that um, through new planning um, and delivery of services um, going forward so that's me Greg. Okay thanks thanks Nicola I, I think we're now we're now going over to um, a, a, a Q&A a Q and A break uh, before we come back and talk yes. about medium and longer term. We have a we have a couple of questions that have come in through the Q and A, both from um, both from Cameron, uh, particularly around looking around the um, the uh, the uh, the social care uh, provision. So uh, the first one being, will there be a new deal for social care following this crisis? What might this mean for the sector's provision of care and support services? Which seem to have been gradually reducing across the UK in recent years. Greg, do you want to quote <clears throat> that? Um, perhaps if I start, and then then Nicola might like yes. to come in. Um, social care has been ducked year after year after year, kick, kicked into the um, kicked into the long grass by government because. Either it was never really understood, or it's seen as a as a poor relation to to health, or it's in the somewhere between the too difficult box and the too expensive box. I think that one of the uh, one of one of the big the, uh, the 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 big takeaways that this situation has highlighted is the importance of social care. Um, not just in relation to health, but as 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 as, as a as, as a major focus in its own right. I've certainly seen um, uh, um, opinion opinion poll results which have shown very significant numbers of people um, really keen to see uh, significant funding being being put into social care. I think a lot of this is a lot of this has been highlighted by the tragic situation in so many care homes up and down the, the, the country where where people were um, released from hospital and put into care homes without testing and the, and the disease has spread quite significantly. Um, and that's rightly and understandably upset an awful lot of people, not just those who have tragically lost um, members of their own family. Um, I believe that it does need to mean um, a new settlement for social care. And um, my hope is that government is going to hear those messages and, and, and take it seriously in funding terms. Though, of course, as with all other areas of public policy, so much, as, so much money has been thrown at shoring up the economy that we don't know what's going to be left at the end of it, nor indeed how long it's going to take uh, to, to, to see a, a new focus. Okay, that, that's great. Thanks, Greg. Nicola, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I, would, I would agree with Greg around um, residential care. I mean, I do think that we will need to rethink the model, um, particularly given um, the experience in care homes. If we talk about the experience from my experience from working with the homeless sector has been extremely positive and public health and um, public health agencies work very closely with ourselves and I, I feel that there's maybe been a, a shift in attitude to the work that's done in the sector not that it's said that it was negative before but I think there is a recognition that the people who are working in temporary accommodation um, are working in that 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 care got care work capacity and not simply just um, support workers housing support workers and um, if you can put it like that so um, I would certainly hope that there would be closer working. Ideally, I would like to see a joint funding pot between um, health and care and housing. And it's not just something that's, that's provided through the housing executive in terms of supporting people. And I think there's great recognition that the sector has done remarkably well in terms of preventing a public health crisis within the homeless population. And I think we need to um, capture that. Um, and bottle that and make sure that we don't actually lose momentum going forward. So whether there will there'll be um, a social care revolution, um, Cameron, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I certainly think that attention, greater attention will be paid to those who are providing that type of support service to very vulnerable people, in, including the people that you work with who are, who are older. So um, okay. yeah, that's, that's great. 
just on a related point, you're, you're right that we've been we've been fortunate in in our sector that we haven't um, suffered as much uh, directly in terms of COVID nineteen infections as uh, as care homes. And uh, Sheena McCallion has come up with a, a good question about there has been that focus on care homes and homelessness. However, supported living appears not to be at the forefront. What can we do to address this in Northern Ireland? I guess this sort of feeds on to the, the just the, the the funding base has gradually been eroded over the last number of years. What do you think, Nicola? I speak to you. Take your views first of all, and then quickly, Greg's. Um, I guess there will be a rethink around this. Um, as some of you may know, that um, and, and talking about in terms of temporary accommodation provision as opposed to supported living here. But Campbell to Kell finished the work that, that I was leading on around the strategic review of temporary accommodation. Um, there very much is a need to, to refigure, reconfigure services. Um, and I think that the, t the time is right to do that, to take on board the work that's been done, to take on board um, the recommendations. Um, and I think we, we will see very different models um, moving forward in the future. I think in terms of the funding that's going into supported living, absolutely, you know, there needs to be a, um, increased investment in it. Um, and what's coming out of this, which I, which I didn't touch, I talked about staff and issues, but what's coming out of this very strongly is that, um, I mean, staffing are obviously our, our biggest resource and they're very, you know, a lot of staff, particularly in the homeless sector, are on minimum wage, as we know, and haven't had a pay increase. And providers are, are struggling with, and employers are struggling with, how do they maintain that motivation um, and that support for their staff? There's also issues with, you know, mental health coming out and, and being at the front line of all of this. So there is a case to be made that we need to recognise that um, there needs to be additional investment, not only in, in, the, in the service itself, but also in the people who are, who are delivering that, that service. So I certainly believe that that's on the agenda and it's something I know that, that I and others will continue to push. That's great. Greg, any, any comments? I mean, I know you said we've got to wait to see how much funding there is available, but do you, do you get a sense from a, a UK government perspective that there's a, there's a desire to do more? Support, supported living is a, is a, is a particular uh, problem area that has um, been a major area of focus in the last couple of years in, in England. Um, uh, and what, is, what has happened there? And it, it links to... It links to what I was saying earlier about um, lack of lack of government funding, but also focus on this um, this sector, where what we've seen is a number of providers getting uh, housing associations, particularly, but not only housing associations, getting out of the supported living market because the financial returns aren't there, and it could potentially seen as potentially. Uh, a, capable of damaging their, their, their wider business plans. Local authorities having the principal responsibility for um, housing, housing people or fi finding, finding, um, finding accommodation for those um, presenting with, with particular, uh, particular needs in respect of supported living. And a number of housing associations having sprung up or, or grown from in some cases, relatively small family uh, family based outfits um, with with funding from real estate investment trusts and others um, where the the REIT or the investor owns the freehold of the property, um, they lease it to one of these specialized supported housing associations. Um, and those organisations then getting into difficulties because the deals have been done based on um, on um, them them paying the uh, the freeholder uh, on uh, contracts that are index linked over a 20, 25, 30 year periods, and these organisations having not having the strength. Um, to cope with the the growth that 's been required of them, and one by one the regulate the English regulator has been um, taking taking special measures or downgrading these these associations and this is a direct result of there not being enough funding for supported living 
people getting out of the market, others coming into the market who can't actually cope for it, and private investment coming in looking for rates of return that are not deliverable. Um, I've seen indications that um, some organisations are looking to do looking to do similar um, in Ireland, both north and south, but it hasn't developed. It's, it's really something to watch out for, and, and frankly, that ought to be addressed in terms of central government policy and funding. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, that's a good uh, point, I think, to move on to our, our second session. Um, Greg, you're going to speak now on the, the, what the future housing management maintenance could look like and what future development could look like. So um, sure. thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Ben. So, <clears throat> um, sorry, it's not responding. Um, follow, following on from what I was saying earlier about the um, the focus of the um, the WhatsApp group um, on on immediate issues, what we've seen is is is, is moving into a kind of interim phase. Uh, the govern we've seen governance, which has been concentrating in many organizations on um, risk-based risk -based approaches, moving to resilience-based. Um, business plans, organizations have been remodeling those in some cases almost on a week-by-week -week basis as their, their projections have, have changed for um, um, in, income and um, potential expenditure. Uh, for, so you know the, the the potential the potential concern there has been around um, rental income reducing arrears and bad debts increasing um, repairs backlogs being built up so that just at the time you know a, a concern so that just at the time when organisations might be in a position to go back to something like normal in terms of their their their, their focus on delivery of repairs. Um, is the time when um, they are suffering significant reductions in their in their income um, concerns over uh, unsold properties um, I mean certainly i can 't speak about Northern Ireland, but figures I saw recently in England suggest that housing associations are sitting on something like three thousand properties that are there for for market sale um, that they haven 't been able to shift um, but also a sense that the housing market is going to dip over the course of this year um, we, we, we've also been um, seeing projections of across the UK half a million fewer house sales than uh, than one would normally expect um, but also house prices reducing now plainly this is going to vary from one part of the UK to another but across the board I mean different different valuers will say will come up with different figures um, anywhere between three and ten percent reduction in sales and where uh, housing schemes are going to be part are intended to be part funded through cross subsidy um, that's a major that's a major concern at the same time um, people looking for more development grant in, in, in part of course to take account of a, a reduction in the effectiveness of or the availability of cross-subsidy funds, but is there going to be funding available, for, you know, as I was saying before, in relation to social care? Is there going to be funding available from government um, for um, increased grant, given what, what they're having to throw at the economy generally to keep things moving um, in, in the face of the effects of, uh, the effects of lockdown and, and beyond? Um, supply chain um, and the strength of supply chains uh, are also a major um, a major concern, um, particularly uh, in relation to local contractors, local suppliers. Um, are their businesses robust? Are they going to be able to continue? Do they have a future? Will they still be there um, as as they're needed? Charity partners. Um, while, while uh, some funds have been made available from the Treasury to support lo uh, lo local charities and indeed larger charities, the concern is that many of those will be unable to continue operating or certainly not to continue operating in the way that they, they have up to now and to deal with, to deal with demands. Um, we've also seen um, an increase in um, areas like uh, mergers and acquisitions and whereas whereas with mergers there there have been 
quite a quite a few organisations that have that, that have said in the past, no, we don't want to merge. We want to remain independent and and separate. Um, and we believe we're sufficiently robust. And if we get into difficulties, then we'll just stop developing and we'll carry on as a housing management provider. If we're now in a situation, however, where people's housing management income and their ability to keep going um, as organizations is being threatened by the effects of um, unemployment um, and um, difficulties with, with rent collection um, and with arrears spiking, then that safety net may be springing a few holes. And what we've had, what, what we've been hearing from a number of organizations is um, a sense that maybe we should start to look at whether a partnership relationship with another housing association or, or whatever um, would be beneficial and we should start looking at that now rather than in, rather than in six months time given that we don't know where we're going to be in six months time so there's been an uh, increasing amount of interest in in that sort of area also stock rationalization um links links back in part to what what i was saying earlier about organizations seeking to maximize their cash holdings where one has um, a housing association that might have i don't know let's let's say 50 homes quite distinct geographically from from the rest of their housing stock um that, that perhaps cost them a bit more to um, manage and maintain than um than the rest of their stock by virtue of being remote um people have been saying, is there a local housing association that could take these over from us, enable us to reduce our costs per unit of management and maintenance, and at the same time, give us a cash injection. So we've, cert we've certainly seen um, that as, a, as an area of, of interest and focus. So I'm trying to get to the next slide. Right, operations. Um, so this is this is this is thinking about how housing management and maintenance might change. As I was saying before, I don't I, I don't see, and I'm sure that's that that's shared by um, other colleagues on this in, in this webinar. We are not going to go back to the situation that we were in. Let's say let's say January. Um, Organisations have shown that they can run a significant part of their operations with people working remotely. That doesn't mean that I, that, that I don't see um, a future for, for offices. Um, I do, but people will be using offices quite differently. Um, I think in many cases, um, people who, uh, staff who might have been working five days a week um, uh, within a, in, in, in going into the office to do that, um, are in future much more likely to be working two, three days a week from home. Um, if you can do it, then why not? Um, tenancy management and areas like floating support and resident engagement, that's all shifted over to being uh, carried out by, by phone or, or online. I mean, certainly we've seen examples on, on the WhatsApp group where chief executives have shared their arrangements uh, for um, doing doing viewings, um, doing viewings online and doing virtual uh, virtual tenancy signups. I think that a lot of that is is going to continue. Um, certainly, come across quite a number of cases where residents, particularly older residents, have have uh, been saying, "Oh goodness me! Since lockdown, I've never had so much um, so much contact from my social landlord as as I have now." And where people don't need a physical visit and can be reasonably contacted by telephone, well, that's happening. Uh, and plainly, a housing officer can get more get get around a lot more people by phone um, or, or, or perhaps email um, than um, than would be the case uh, where where they're, where they're simply um, doing visits. Um, mental health, as I, as I mentioned earlier, a major as it's going to be a major focus. Um, it's it's a shame that it's taken this uh, pandemic to bring that to people's attention but um, it, it clearly is right up there. And the way that we provide support for um, our residents um, in, in relation to mental health, but also to our staff um, is, is an issue that's not going to go away and is going to remain clearly on the forefront of, of people's minds. Um, housing, al housing allocations I, I've mentioned. 
Another, an another issue that the, um, the pandemic and the responses to it have highlighted is just how important so many people, um, you know, and we're talking about nurses, delivery drivers, um, uh, you know, po postmen and women and, and so on, are to the functioning of the economy. And a, a recognition that they need to be provided with reasonable support in relation to housing. Um, we, we saw the G15, the large London housing associations, a couple of weeks ago announcing that they were going to be um, supporting an initiative nationally to um, provide 100,000 homes for heroes, not just um, health and health and care workers, but other, other people who can reasonably be described as, as, as key workers um, that would be genuinely affordable. Um, and, and that's going to be reflected, I think, in, in housing allocations, um, expectations. Um, working practices uh, for re repairs and maintenance, and I've referred to AI, there, there, was, there was an interesting um, article in Inside Housing about three weeks ago, looking at the use of augmented reality technology in repairs and maintenance. And they, they highlighted several examples, Kingdom Housing in five carbon homes in northeast England and uh, Walsall Housing Group in, in the West Midlands, where um, a, a lot of the diagnosis and um, engagement with, with residents around um, straightforward repairs um, can be done online or and and you know topped up by by, by telephone and that will save um, a lot of time and and a lot of money as well as a lot of aggravation for residents um, certainly i was I was having discussions quite a number of years ago with a major telecoms and alarm supplier um, around um, uh, systems that could be built into new homes that would um, provide information to the landlord remotely on when, when uh, key components, such as in, in relation to the heating, uh, were going wrong. There is no reason why more of this can't be done. We've seen um, housing associations like Holton Housing Trust, flagship in, in East Anglia, um, and now I think Yorkshire Housing, um, actually looking at providing iPads to, to residents which a lot of people looked at and said, well, that's a bit extravagant. But you know what, if providing an iPad to a resident and enabling them to um, diagnose and perhaps deal with um, particular repairs issues, if something like that saves two, two, two repairs call outs a year, it seems to me that the numbers are not looking so, um, are not looking so silly. We're also likely, I believe, to see an increased use of AI in um, in the care area and supported housing, and that is plainly more a bit more controversial. Um, and um, I was on a, I was on a web webinar last week with Aileen Evans from Grand Union Housing and uh, this year's CIH president, and she was she was talking about uh, the importance to look at um, look at governance in, in in that sort of area. Nonetheless, it is coming. I mean, we're not going fully Japanese Japanese robot style um, just yet, but this this debate is is going to be happening over the next few years and moving on to development i'm having trouble turning over the um the slide there we are development i think is 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 a really interesting area um and and one where where i think we're going we're going to Uh, Greg, we're just having a, a pause on your video. Uh, let's just give give Greg a couple. Of, just give him a minute. Um, the um, new approach might be worth just turning off your. Oh, okay. Can you hear me yet? Yep, that's fine. You just froze for a minute. Okay, thanks. Um, development. Um, if we start with the point that a, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of organisations that are going to be saying, um, as their lease as their office leases expire, we've been able to work substantially remotely. Um, we want to retain our office, but we don't need, let us say, ten thousand square feet, three thousand square feet, four thousand square feet. We'll be fine. Um, firstly, 
that's quite interesting from the perspective of how much of the redundant office accommodation, because I think at the same time, as demand reduces, prices are going to reduce, uh, whether that's for rent or, 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 or to purchase office accommodation, how much of that may be suitable for conversion into, into housing. Um, Sim and, and, and on the other side, what people are looking for as individuals, whether it's um, homes to rent or homes to buy, I think is going to change. Many people are going to be saying, I need something that's good enough for me to, uh, to, to work in um, remotely part, part of the time. So there's going to be a focus in, in new development on, on the sort of space standards that are available. It's not just, but it's not just about, about space within the home and, and indeed storage. It's also going to be about access to green space. Is there somewhere that when I'm working, and a day when I'm working at home, I can go outside and, and just relax and um, wander, wander around equally? Are there going to be other facilities that I need? Are, is there going to be, you know, are there going to be shops? Are there going to be community hubs and, and, and so on? Um, are we going to see people looking at moving out of cities to less expensive areas on the same sort and on the same sort of basis um, and moving over to construction methods um, i think that we're going to see a significant increase in off-site manufacture uh, modern methods of construction which currently is only has been in the last few years only around two percent of of output in in the um, uk house building sector Firstly, if we, if we work on the assumption that physical distancing is going to be with us in one form or another for um, a not insignificant period of time, the, the methods are much more deliverable under a physical distancing regime. Secondly, um, off-site manufacture uh, tends to be a lot quicker than traditional forms of construction. And thirdly, certainly where we're talking about taller buildings, then... Um, Experts in the area assure me that it is it becomes cost competitive above about six stories and down in the bottom right of of the slide you'll see um, the legal and general factory in um, factory in Leeds. Right, and at that point I'd like to, I'd like to pause. Okay, uh, that's great, Greg. Um, that was a fascinating session. Uh, I could, could could listen to that for for a long time, uh, a lot longer, but. Um, since I don't have, uh, I, I'll, I'll take the, the, the prerogative of uh, chairing this to ask a couple of questions. Um, I thought it was interesting your point, just in terms of development, about moving out of cities. I guess one of the challenges is, particularly if increasingly we're seeing people working remotely, and that's a more longer term thing. One of the challenges of moving out of cities is the uh, availability of decent broadband, which can affect uh, affect the ability to, uh, to, to work remotely. That's, that's more an observation than a question. But I guess um, in terms of remote working, as you say, uh, historically, that was something that, you know, the idea of the home, the concept of the home office was something that people at senior levels were more likely to focus on. But now, um, because of the pandemic, we're seeing people at all levels of employment, all um, different levels, socioeconomic levels are working remotely. How, how can we facilitate that whenever you have a welfare system that works against you having any kind of suitable space? It makes it more difficult to have that suitable space for remote working. I mean, that's, that's going to have, we're going to have to look at the whole. Uh, I know that uh, some of the associations locally were looking at how they could accommodate remote working space within the confines of, uh, you know, the bedroom tax, which hasn't come in here yet, but, you know, looking forward if that were to come in. Do you have any particular thoughts? These is, these issues are going to be are going to be really important, and um, people are going to be people and businesses are going to be focusing on them. Um, I, I've been on I've been in several discussions recently with with architects um, and others who specialise in in areas around uh, modern methods of construction, and they're really quite excited by um, the opportunities that this is inevitably bringing up. Um, there are aspects that we will need government to address and, and um, you know, bedroom tax in relevant parts of the, of the UK is a good example, but people are going to recognise realities and markets, markets are going to change. I mean, there is, there is a, a huge need for, for housing across, across the UK, as we know. Um, there are going to be the challenges of 
um, insufficient government funding being being available because as I, as I was saying um, the the amount of money that is having to be um, having to be thrown at shoring up the economy if there are ready opportunities um, that will that will come forward and I think um, um, uh, office office to residential conversions is is one of them then people are inevitably going to move in that direction i mean there are there are other changes that could be put in place that i think there would be um a lot of cross-party support for uh one is around um release of public land which the government's been talking about for a number of years but hasn't actually given the push that's needed it would probably require a legislative change so that treasury is no longer um, forcing um, government agencies that have got such as the health service that have got land to dispose of that they necessarily need to get full market value um, another would be land value capture um, and what what happens to the value of land when uh, agricultural land for example or brownfield land when it gets planning permission for for residential i mean again it's an area where i think there would be a lot of cross-party support we're going to be debating these issues for years um and um it's it's too early to say exactly how they're going to go but but there are potential solutions there for us um you're absolutely right about broadband ben um and um you know my, i've got my own i seem to have my own wobbles um at this end um 20 years ago i was i was doing work for home group i was based in one of their offices in southeast england their head office was in newcastle and it's a national organization and i was doing video conferencing with them um, it worked absolutely fine Okay, it wasn't running on the same kind of broadband networks that we're dealing with now. But when we think about the struggles that we've had to get A, broadband working properly, and B, the sort of applications that, that we're working on now, Zoom and Teams, um, th this, um, it, it's, it's quite remarkable how much has not happened in 20 years. 20 years is a lifetime in tech, um, but it is happening now, and it's, and, and it's the market driving it. Okay, and just on that point, before I bring you in, Nicola, we, we've got a question that's come in from Donald Conway about what do you think of the view on the using your crystal ball on the survival rates for contractors, particularly those providing response and repair services as a result of COVID, the reduction in orders, uh, new construction methods, and then Brexit. So <laughs> you've got we've got a whole two minutes to answer that. That's basically uh, all encompassing. And Nicola, while you're at it, can you tell us what the lottery numbers are going to be? Um, I think there's huge challenges um, for contractors. I think there's huge challenges on getting supplies in here, and, and, and I'm just speaking from from experience myself. Um, you know, I'm getting a bit of work done at the minute. The, the, the tree fell down when there was a, that gale last week, so we need to get a fence put up. Um, and the the guy came and he said, "Look, this is going to take week, weeks just to get." you know, some wood to make this fence for you because whenever you go into builders merchants, just one in, one out, and by the time you get in, a lot of stuff's gone. You know, so so and I think we all appreciate and that's a very small scale thing. So just in terms of being able to get um, materials for building, um it's it's a huge challenge and I and I would be concerned about some of the, the smaller contractors and how they're they're managing through this. Um, and having Brexit on top of that, Ben, that's your topic. I think you've got to answer that one. You know? well, I, <laughs> won't, uh, I won't. I won't. I won't talk at length about that. Um, but uh, no, that's very helpful. I mean, Greg, just very quickly, um, do you see from a from a UK perspective? Do you see we're going to see a rationalisation on the contracting side in the same way you're talking about? Potentially, we're going to see some consolidation or more increased partnerships from the association side. I think it's. I think it's quite possible. I mean, and. and, and a number of the larger contractors were in whether we're talking about repairs or um, or house building um, have been in difficulties in in recent years and I think the danger is that the, this situation pushes things over the edge what what we've also been seeing though is um, an increasing number of housing associations interested in or, or, or actually acquiring um, uh, maintenance or construction companies. I think there's there's going to be more of that, um, particularly for the 
Well, it, it's, it's not even necessarily always just, just the largest housing associations. Some um, medium-sized associations have been getting into those markets where they can find the right contractor. Um, and that helps them by reducing costs and also reducing VAT, for example, um, and also by re reduce, reducing uncertainty um, in, in terms of uh, work pipelines. Okay, well, look, that's great. Uh, I think if um, it's okay with you, thank you for that, uh, that question. We'll move on to our, our final session about the big takeaways. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Ben. Um, all right, let me just find it. Okay, so where is this, where is this all going? Um, ultimately, we will only get through this if and when we get a vaccine, and unfortunately it is if, or um, medication that enables, enables us to manage the effects of um, COVID-19. I mean, in the way that, for example, there is no vaccine to, to deal with HIV AIDS or, or to deal with Ebola. Um, we don't know how long either of those is going to take. Um, listen to as expert epidemiologists. I'm not talking about the um, expert epidemiologists who've sprung up on social media in recent weeks, um, but the real ones. Um, and nobody's saying less than less than 12 months and many are saying 24 months and that's that's to the point of having a vaccine um, that, that works and has been tested on, on sufficient numbers of people so that one can be reasonably sure about it and then of course it's a matter of getting it getting manufactured in bulk and rolled out across the world so we have to assume that in some form or another dealing with the, the virus is going to be with us for a very long time. There is, and you know, at the minimum, that, that will affect physical distancing um, and the way that we we uh, we engage with um, with with people of all kinds at work and 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 socially. Um, the economy is going to take a, a really long time to recover. I mean, it's impossible to know how long. Some people talk about five years. Some people talk about 10 years. Certainly, um, we're looking at what's likely to be longer than, than it took to uh, get over the effects of the 2007 to 2009 crash. In that time, unemployment is going to have grown significantly and poverty, too, will have grown significantly. The picture on homelessness is, is uncertain. Um, Brexit still awaits and, and, and of course um, we have the possibility of um, a no deal exit which you know month by month or week by week certainly um, that appears to be more and more likely. Um, antagonism towards elites I mean I think this is this is this is an international phenomenon um, we're seeing as quite a bit of that um, at the moment, I mean, and elites can be defined in very different ways. They can be defined by um, senior government advisors who uh, choose to set restrictions for the rest of us and then go and then go and break them willy willy nilly um, in in the interest of getting an eye test um, or whatever. Um, but we're also seeing it to, to a degree um, in, in, in the States with aspects of the, the fallout over the, um, the, the uh, police murder of um, George Floyd the other week. Um, it's hard to know how that's all, how that's all going, to, going to play out, but it is, there is a, a force there and there's the potential for um, civil disorder. Um, a number of a number of organisations were, were planning for that as part of their, and I'm talking about housing associations among, you know, alongside local authorities, were planning for that um, as part of their uh, their risk management work um, in in the in the run up to um, the Brexit decisions last year. When and. We've seen a lot of changes introduced by, by, by government just in the course of the last few months, the Coronavirus Act, uh, which, which gives sweeping powers in a number of respects. 
the UK is no different from other countries um, around the world, that when leaders take on additional powers to deal with particular pressing problems, they tend to be quite slow to give those, give those powers back. We will see. Um, I mean, as far as the UK is concerned, conversely, there is also a push towards greater devolution um, at, at, at local and, and regional level. Um, it's a mi it's a mixed picture, and I don't have uh, I'm not in a position to give clear project projections, but we will need to watch that. What is fair to say, though, is that change is is the um, is the only constant, as as, as has been said before. Um, there are going to be more crises. We've had crises in the last in the last twenty years. We've had other we've had other pandemics, um, SARS, MERS, Ebola. Um, we've had the financial crash. There will be more crises. Um, I don't say this to depress people. Rather, it's about being realistic. And, and, and we, look, we, need, we need to look at our scenario planning. How are we going to deal with situations that we can't quite foresee? The next one could be a pandemic. It could be climate change related. It could be linked to um, the, um, the continuing economic crisis. But we need to make sure that our organisations are robust and able to cope with a range of, a range of changes. Um, there are going to be new expectations from customers, new expectations from staff. People know that services can be delivered differently and often, hopefully, better, as in some of the areas I was talking about um, a few minutes ago. Um, Nicola was talking earlier about partnership and collaboration work in relation to, to homelessness in Northern Ireland. The partnership and collaboration work similarly that we've seen on the uh, Chief Executive's WhatsApp group has been extraordinary. Um, day after day, we've seen people on there say, you know, Chief Executive's on there saying, has anybody got a policy to deal with whatever it might be? Um, you know, aspects around repairs, aspects around furloughing, uh, virtual tenancy signups, and so on. And the chances are that within an hour or two, two or three um, other chief executives will, will say, yes, we're dealing with it in this way. Um, and one of them will say, and here's our policy, and they'll upload the document. Um, housing associations, the, the, the housing sector generally, has got a reasonably good track record on partnership and collaborative working. Um, but it's mixed. They, they very often appear to be in competition, and that competition is not going to disappear. But do we need that, that? There will always be areas on which we can work more effectively together. Um, there have also been signs on the group about people working with um, health aid, health agencies, care providers, voluntary organisations. I mean, for example. Um, where staff have been have been furloughed, or or there isn't there isn't immediate work for them. Um, are there are there things that they can do with uh, delivering food to care homes? There have been a number of examples of that that we've heard about. And what about the jo joint work that we've seen in in different parts of the UK with councils around providing um, accommodation for for homeless people, where councils have got the uh, the, the pr primary responsibility. I think that as we see, um, as we see government strapped for cash, local authorities strapped for cash, um, charities strapped for cash, and in some cases unable to continue, the sort of demands that ordinary people raise on um, housing associations are, are going to increase because the other institutions that they might be used to going to are simply unable to, to deliver. And I think that there is medium to longer term, a really crucial role for housing associations as a kind of community glue that holds things together. Um, it's, it's a challenge for all of us. Um, the situation is is grim, it's going to continue to be grim, but there are going to be positives coming out of it. And uh, th th there's a quote that I'm, I'm, I'm always reminded of, uh, which people have said was down to Winston Churchill. Um, he, apparently he didn't say it, but it's a good one anyway. Never waste a good crisis. 
Um, there will be opportunities arising out of all of these difficulties and we need to continue rising to the challenge. I think the housing sector's response to extreme circumstances has been absolutely brilliant from top to bottom. Um, and we need to we need to build on that. And um, <laughs> no presentation, dare I say, on um, COVID-19 and the UK would be complete without um, a picture of national hero Tom Moore, who uh, at age 100 or just, just shy of 100 raised 32 million for, the, uh, for, for NHS charities. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Greg. Um, that's a, that's a, quite a, a whistle stop tour of everything. Um, so that's uh, great to be able to get through that so quickly. Um, Nicola, I'm sure, like me, you were following the, uh, the Housing Amendment Bill. Um, which is going through the assembly uh, to, for us to finally get reclassification reversed, and uh, I think hopefully we're all we all hope that we can um, get that passed, provide more certainty for a sector, and then start to use FTC financial transactions capital for new affordable housing. But one of the things that really struck me was um, there is still a, a real desire for, um, in terms of the housing executive, it's you know it's a very emotive it's a very emotive uh, subject. We've talked about, uh, our various people have talked about reform of the housing executive. Do you think, you know, to, to pick on Greg's thing, and I've heard Ram uh, Emanuel, former uh, mayor of Chicago and um, chief of staff to Barack Obama, he also was quoted as saying, using that same quote about never waste a, a crisis. Do you think there's any chance that this could spur on the reform of the housing executive or make it less likely to happen and just be another excuse to kick things down the road? That's Nicola? a big question. I know. <laughs> um, I think everything's up for debate at the minute, and I think the time is right to, to, to start to have those discussions. I mean, obviously, we're in, we're in a situation where um, we have a, a chief executive who um, was outgoing, is outgoing, um, and has, he, he's going to be standing, standing on longer now for a period of time. So I can't see a lot of change happening, you know, until probably it gets a, a new leader. Um, I certainly think it's time for reform. I think um, time's overdue for it. Um, what we're up against now is uh, the, the, the clock's ticking on the mandate here uh, with our assembly. So there's obviously a big rush and a big push to get through priority legislation. Um, so whether it will happen in, the, in this mandate, I don't know. It's something that, that we, we need to grapple with. I think the housing executive itself is facing its challenges in terms of... Um, you know, staff working remotely and all the rest of it. And what will that look like moving forward? I mean, I think all of us are, are, are looking around saying, right, well, if staff are working remotely, do we need them to be doing the things they're doing or do we need them to be doing different things, you know? Um, and I think it will lead to um, restructuring um, and reconfiguration of, of their services as well. But um, it, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, as you know, um, to bring about, you know, change within the housing sector is just due to its, its sheer size. And it's obviously, the housing still, unfortunately, is still very political. But um, I think we do need to start um, opening up discussions around that. Um, and in particular, from, from where we're sitting at the minute, having um, supporting people funding sitting within the regional services and having homelessness sitting under landlord services. I mean, it has caused... Um, problems for a number of years and I, and I would be keen to start having discussions around perhaps some of that could change moving forward. Okay, Greg, on a, on a related point, um, I'd be keen to get your thoughts. England's a few, uh, a few weeks ahead of uh, Northern Ireland, particularly in areas like um, reopening the housing market. Um, and I'd just I'd be interested to get your thoughts. Are there any particular learning points you think for Northern Ireland that we could take from how England has, has, has sort of exited lockdown in that aspect to try and open up housing? I mean, I guess there's been some immediate things, but as you say, all these things, it's not about us trying to go back to what was the previous normal. So there are things that are changed in terms of virtual viewings. We know you talk about cross-subsidy. Next 10 years is at a less advanced stage in Northern Ireland than it is in, in England, but it's still something that we, we, you know, we're keen to see develop as a sector. But you have, going back to my previous time in um, in our ICS, the old bugbear of valuations and how that can clog up things. But are there any particular learning points you think in terms of how the housing market has reopened that you think have gone well or gone badly that we could be mindful of here? 
some some organizations seem to have been able to i mean i was talk, talking to a chief executive of a london housing association um a couple of days ago and he was saying that actually they'd been um <clears throat> they, they'd been able to that they, they'd kept their um sales team going in place they hadn't they hadn't furloughed them or anything like that and they'd been able to complete a number of sales using um drive-by or um online on online valuations or sort of a drive a drive-by combined with um uh, you know vi videos from within the, within the property um and um he was he was even surprised to note that um that there was no that there, there hadn't at that point been any any sign or up, up, up to this point been any signs of uh, values dropping even though the um the major the major surveying firms surveyors and valuers reckon there will be um it is possible to do to do an awful lot i think at an, at an early stage um people were saying um or oh, you can only really do drive by valuations on um new stock not on existing stock i don't think that's proven to be the case um Apart from that, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to suggest that Northern Ireland should learn anything from the way that England's been doing, um, been, been uh, releasing, releasing lockdown and what have you at, at, at national level. Um, I'm fairly, um, fairly critical, shall we say, of the way that government has handled, central government has handled all sorts of matters from the outset. Um, get the messaging right, apart from anything else. Be clear what you can do and what you can't do, and tell people. Um, that yes. would be a key start. I don't know if that really answers your question, Ben. No, that's great. Um, okay. Can... Um, Yes, just in terms of just one final question, one we had from an earlier session that we didn't uh, get a chance to address. What changes might emerge in housing, care and support services for older people following the crisis? I mean, I guess you've talked about um, the provision of uh, uh, iPads for, for, for tenants. Um, digital engagement is, is key and is crucial. And I guess one of the challenges is trying to, for older people, without like generalizing them, is, is, uh, that, that, can be, that can be more, more challenging. But it's something that's only that's only going to going to increase, I guess. Greg, there was there, there was a survey reported last week. Um, I, I'm not sure of the precise numbers, but I think it were, it was something like an ink. It, it, if I remember rightly, it indicated an increase of a third um, of people's. No, it wasn't an increase. It was it was at least a third um, of people surveyed said. That they would not consider care homes for um, themselves if they need, you know, if they needed further support, should we say, um, in the future, or for members of their families. Um, now, this is about residential care, but it also relates to the way that extra care schemes um, are, are designed and and operated, and also sheltered housing. Um, there you know people will people will vote with their feet um they won't be content to go into new accommodation um unless it's configured in such a way that they feel comfortable um so if you're looking at if you're looking at for example extra care it will need to be sufficiently um spread out i mean retirement village style i'm, I'm not aware that there are any retirement villages in Northern Ireland, and, and there aren't as many as one, one might expect around population centres in England, but they've gradually been increasing over recent years. And, and you know, typically one's talking about um, north of um, 200 apartments on quite a big site, you know, sort of four, four five, five acre site going, going up three. Okay, we have frozen there again, Greg. Uh, Nicola, do you have any final points um, on that particular issue just before we wrap yeah. up? I'm just going to pick up on what Greg was saying there, or, or potentially was going to say. It, it's all about the design, isn't it? I mean, and just it's from stories, personal it's the operated by. You froze, Greg. Do you want to finish your point? <laughs> I, I don't know how much. I don't know how far I'd got. You just talked about north of 200 units. Um. 
yeah it's a it's a model that um is 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 particularly popular in the social sector with uh, the extra care charitable trust um also anchor hanover have done some and in the private sector it's it's mccarthy and stone but with some some differences those kinds of schemes i can see having a future yeah. um other kinds of schemes where people are much more on top of one another i think are, are going to suffer from significantly reduced demand um, there's a lot of there's a lot of thinking to be done about this, but actually, uh, it, it will need to be guided by the market. People are going to decide on what's right for them and what and what's not right for them. Okay, Nicola, last two sentences yeah, to you. Just just echo on that. It, it's all about design. Um, and I say I have an elderly aunt who's early stages of dementia, and the family are saying, "Thank goodness she's not in a care home. She's better at home, and um, with care workers coming in and out and, and supporting her." Um, we obviously have concerns about her mental health, obviously, um, regardless of her dementia or not. So we're, we're keen to get her into um, accommodation where she can start to communicate more and, and interact. And, but the, the time um, was right not to move her when we couldn't move her at that time. And it will all come down to design. Um, and I think even in terms of um, the, the homeless sector as well, and host, like self-contained is the way to go. Um, because a lot of the hostels have just too much sharing facilities. Some still have beds, sharing bedrooms, um, sharing toilets, sharing bathrooms, all of that. So um, good and clever design will make a huge difference and people will with their fit. I think there's a huge opportunity for our housing associations really, really to, to showcase what they're doing in those areas. And there's some excellent examples of that. Um, and, and they should be held up as models of excellence um, and we should be moving forward in that direction to provide um, you know, good care and support and keep people living um, in, in those environments and independently for as long as possible.